So this presentation is going to talk about the variables and figures which you are going to use in your experiments. So the thing about variables is that the type of variable that you choose in your experiments will determine then the type of figure that you use. So we are also going to review then within this the scientific method because that's what we're going to use to set up our experiments. So we're going to cover some of the scientific method as it relates to this and then specifically end with the type of figures that we're going to be able to make based on our variables. So first off, the first part of our scientific method, of course, is observation. And with that observation, we generally will come up with questions. Now, the observation we're making here is with tomato plants. So this is similar to your lab document. And we have uh, two people. These are my uh, sons, West on the left here, and his evil twin, Tsu, on the right. I actually only have one son. His name is West, but that's him. And West and Sue both planted tomatoes in the spring. And as we noticed throughout the summer, the uh, West's tomatoes grew much taller and grew many more tomatoes than Sue's. And so the observation is a, a difference in plant height and tomato number. And we couldn't really figure out what's the difference. Well, West is a bit of a picky eater. And what we noticed after asking a few questions um, uh, to them was that West would take the food that he didn't like and he would bury it in the, the ground. And so West had, you know, his carrots over here and... He, anytime we had fish, he didn't like fish, so he would bury his fish over here. And that way he didn't have to eat his food, and um, we didn't know because he was burying it. Well, our question, you know, then is what is the difference between these two? And after doing a little bit of digging and some research, we found out, well, West may have inadvertently then been adding fertilizer to the ground in the form of his food. And, and so then this will lead to a hypothesis or a, an idea for us to set up an experiment. So our next part of the scientific method is that we need to form a hypothesis, uh, some sort of uh, thesis that we can test. And good hypotheses have two things that are common to them and are very important. One is that they are specific. And when they are, the more specific they are, the more testable they are. And the second part is that they need to be falsifiable. So they can't be based on, you know, uh, claims that we just can't test. So it needs to be testable, falsifiable, and very specific. In this class, we're going to use an if-then model to set up our hypothesis. And in the if-then model, what we'll have is if, and that'll contain some sort of statement about our hypothesis. And within that, we're going to have then a biological mechanism or a scientific reason for why we think this is going to happen. And the then part then leads to our prediction. So these can be very difficult to conceptualize because we gotta we gotta do these things. We've got to make it specific and false file. We've got to include a reason. And all this has to do in one sense. So it's okay if it's rough at first. It's okay if it looks um, like some of these things are out of order. Uh, but the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. So let's, let's take a stab at our tomatoes. So let's say if 
Um, old food. All right, and this is the food that's buried by West, right, in the um, planter. If old food, and I, I'm going to add the biological mechanism here, provides... nutrients for tomato growth let's say tomato plant growth all right so we've got our hypothesis here we've got a biological mechanism in the form of nutrients right and maybe we could be a little more specific but this is good for now uh, for tomato plant growth, then, all right, and here's our prediction, right? Uh, then soil with old food buried in it will cause tomato plants Oops. To grow, and we're going to be more specific. What about growing? Or we're going to say they're going to grow higher, or grow taller than those without. And we could also say will cause tomato plants to grow more tomatoes than those without. So we could grow taller slash more tomatoes. than those without. All right, it's a little wordy. We could probably revise it and make it a little more simple, but this has all the things here. We've got our, our hypothesis. We've got our biological mechanism, and then we've got our prediction here. All right, so this would, this would pass. This would give you uh, a pass, full points for your hypothesis. Okay, so let's move on then. Now that we have a hypothesis, we want to set up our experiment and to understand that we need to understand what variables are in play now a variable is any condition that can change within an experiment we want to manipulate just one variable um, otherwise it becomes too complicated to de try to determine what causes the change all right so the variable that we manipulate is called the independent variable Okay, the variable we control or manipulate. And this is the first thing that is that is done. We set it up so that we can alter the amount of the independent variable. So in ours, it's going to be um, fertilizer, right? So plot A will add uh, fertilizer in the form of old and decaying food. Plot B will have no fertilizer. So the independent variable is fertilizer. A has, has fertilizer, has old food. B has no fertilizer. And everything else is going to be the same. So we're going to have the same amount of water, same amount of sunlight. Everything for these two in the similar area is going to be the same. Our dependent variable then is the result, the variable that we are measuring as an effect of the independent variable. So let's say the resulting measurement in an experiment. So what are we going to measure? Well, there's two things we, we could have identified, um, but let's say um, plant height. So we're going to have one on plot A 
that's going to have old food. Plant B, plot B has no no food, no fertilizer, and we're going to measure plant height after uh, two months. Dependent variable would be plant height. Now, there is also a type of variable um, in the type of measurement you're going to make. So you have what's type what's called a categorical variable. which is a, a variable that is split into discrete groups. All right, and that's what we did here. Uh, we made plot A and plot B in different groups. One has fertilizer and one doesn't, all right? We could have also done different types of fertilizer. We could have done old food in A, we could have done uh, miracle Grow in B, and we could have done, you know, some other fertilizer in C. Each of those are a group, and so that's a category. Um, uh, the second type is a continuous variable. All right, and this is one that is numerical or measured on... A, a scale um, and it can be split into decimals um, and so this is and and is um, things like inches or uh, grams you know weight height these things um, so plant height you know how tall how tall this tomato plant is that's a very horrible plant but we're going to measure it in centimeters that's a continuous variable so our independent variable in this instance is the categorical variable of with or without old food and our dependent variable, what we measure at the end, the resulting measure, measurement, is a continuous variable, which is um, the height of a tomato plant. Now, we could also have a, um, a, a ordinal variable, one that is still in discrete units. So, for example, number of tomatoes you can have six or seven or eight. You can't really have eight and a half tomatoes because they don't grow in those units. Um, but that would also then be a continuous variable that um, would be more discrete. Okay, so those are then the different types of, of variables. Now, we can set up our experiments in different ways. What we just described was a controlled experiment. We have a control group, which is where one group has either a known positive or known negative result. In this instance, we have a negative control group where our plot with no fertilizer is our control. So it's just used as, um, as something to measure against. If we only had one group, if we only had the tomatoes with fertilizer, we wouldn't know how well the fertilizer works. So you need to have a control, something there to measure it against. So the controlled experiment has a control group. Okay, a control group is where you have a known response Okay, we know that either in this instance, it's going to grow at a certain amount, but we haven't done anything to the soil, we haven't done anything, we haven't manipulated it. And so we're going to do that for comparison. To our experimental group.
Now, a correlational experiment is a little bit different, okay? This controlled experiment had a um, categorical variable as an independent and a continuous variable as the dependent. In a correlational experiment, we have two continuous variables, at least. Well, what does that look like? Well, what we could do is essentially say, rather than have a control group, what if we had different amounts of fertilizer um, and then looked at different responses to those different amounts, right? So uh, let's say we have in uh, this plot, we're going to put 10 grams of our old food. In this plot, we're going to put uh, 17 grams of old food. In this plot, we're going to put 35 grams of old food. And rather than create a category, what we're actually doing is a continuous variable. So we're varying the amount of um, old food or fertilizer. And we aren't creating a control group. So a correlational experiment does not have a control group. And we're just trying to see how variable A, amount of old food, correlates or changes with another variable. And this variable would be plant height. All right, so after we do the experiment, we're going to get results. And then we want to graph that, right? In graph, and, and in our controlled experiment, the graph we're going to use is a bar chart. And what we're going to do is actually graph the averages. So we'll take then our independent variable, which is on the x-axis, and we'll average everything in group A with group B, right? So on our x-axis, it's going to be groups, right? And group A is going to be with fertilizer, and group B is going to be without fertilizer. That's our independent variable. And then group, uh, our dependent variable is going to be average height, and then we can compare the two because average A looks like this. The average of B looks like this. All right, so that's our controlled experiment. In our correlational experiment, however, we don't have groups. All we have is a continuous uh, set of, of variables, right? So we had uh, 10... Right, and and then our uh, we have different heights on the other. So on the x-axis, we still have uh, instead of our two groups, we have amount of fertilizer, and on the y-axis, we have the height of the plants. And so instead of using a bar chart, we're going to have to use what's called a scatter plot. And what it'll look like is basically a bunch of dots, right? And if we have a good correlation, if the two are related, then you'll be able to start to see a line of some sorts develop. So, right, we can see here that it looks like we have a positive relationship. As you increase the amount of fertilizer, you increase the height of plants. Now, to actually see how effective that is, we would 
put statistical tests to it, and we'll talk more about that. But basically, what we then created was the, the type of study, correlational had two continuous variables, was what determined then the type of graph we're going to make. A scatter plot with two continuous variables, which is a correlational study. And when we have one control, one um, continuous, and one categorical, we're going to use a bar chart. All right, that's it.